Hi everyone, it's Amy. I just wanted to warn you that the following episode with grief specialist Lisa Williams contains a lot of talk of death by suicide. If you or someone you love or know needs help, please reach out to 988, which is the suicide hotline. That's 988. Thanks and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Little Miss Recap. Today, I am joined by grief specialist, therapist, social worker, all the things, Lisa Williams. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Well, I reached out because, as you know, as I told you in my initial email, uh, this month we've suffered a, a tragic loss in the mm-hmm. Sister Wives fandom, in I would argue reality TV. Yeah, And um, I, I, I felt like we needed to bring in an expert to just mm-hmm. kind of take the temperature down a little bit, talk about what some people are experiencing, what what's going on. And I found your organization, What's Your Grief? And I would love it if you would just tell my audience a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so What's Your Grief? We're uh, largely online, though we exist in, in real life as well, organization. Um, we've been around since 2012. Um, my co-founder and I are both mental health professionals who have been working in grief for a, quite a number of years. And we were working primarily with traumatic and unexpected deaths in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where we're based. And we have this really kind of unique job in that we were meeting with people in the hospital at the time of their family members' traumatic or unexpected death. And we were working with them for two years to follow. And part of what's unique about that is most grief support services are people are seeking out support. They're coming to you and saying, I want counseling. I want a support group. I want... And this was not that, right? Like they met us in the hospital. It was like, here's the grief support lady. She'll be with you for the next two years. And so we got this sense of a real clear understanding of the huge ranges of the way that people grieve and -hmm. what they want in terms of support. And there were some people who really, really wanted and could benefit from traditional therapy and support groups and, you know, that sort of thing. And then there were a huge number of people that that was not their thing at all. It was not their coping style. It was not the way that they felt comfortable accessing grief support. And at that time, back in 2012, there was really very little else out there that was for kind of non that non traditional grief support. I would not say non traditional grievers because just as many people are have a grief style that doesn't tend to counseling and support groups as those who do. So we founded What's Your Grief as a space online that could be really more about creative expression for grief, learning and education, tapping into kind of action-oriented things that people could do. Um, And so we have hundreds of articles all written by grief experts, a podcast, online learning communities, online spaces where people can, if they want, connect with other people, but also just hang back and learn and explore grief on their own kind of terms in their own homes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's really kind of what came together. I, I guess I'll also say a big part of our story and founding What's Your Grief was that we each had a number of personal losses that were really significant and shaped the way that we thought about grief and grief support. Mm. Um, so, you know, my dad died when I was 18. When I was 26, my sister's partner died of a drug overdose. And both of those really shaped a lot of the yeah. ways that I thought about grief support. Um, so that is another piece, I guess, that plays into What's Your Grief. So that's a long answer. No, I love that. And I love the idea of of meeting people where they are and not mm-hmm. not necessarily expecting everyone to seek out traditional therapy and going about things the same way. I um I worked extensively with school shooting survivors when I was putting together my book and mm-hmm. I saw so many different forms of grief. You know, a lot of people, especially when we were working with Columbine survivors and school shootings around that time, they just didn't talk about it. Like, Mm -hmm. and so that grief has to go somewhere, right? So it just came out in different forms. And then you see in the later incidents in Parkland and stuff like that, um, 
these survivors, unfortunately, there's enough to make a community, right? They're starting to yeah. support one another. And that's a different form. And it's just really, it's, it's always interested me how people, you know, I'm just fascinated by human dynamics to begin with, but how people get through some of the hardest times in their lives. And there is no traditional path. There is no right way. So I, I love what your organization does. I think it's really great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I appreciate what you said so much about how people find each other and find the ways to support each other that work for them in different little kind of enclaves and alcoves in real life and online. And I think being open to that huge range of what it looks like is so important because it is. It's so different for everyone. Yeah. And I think there's a certain amount of, there's a narrative out there today that's like, well, just go to therapy. Like everyone needs to be in right. therapy, but there is a privilege to that because not everyone can afford therapy. So yeah. And, and aside like this is great. Yeah. And, and aside from the fact that not everybody can afford it, not everybody wants it, nor should they right. feel like a pressure to, but also research that's found, especially with grief, that it's not necessarily more helpful than not getting support uh, through traditional therapy and that some people, the way they process grief isn't through the things that traditional therapy accesses, like that emotional processing. So there's a lot of good evidence that shows that therapy and counseling are really helpful for some people and some particular ways of grieving and types of loss and just yeah. not for others. And, and that's just kind of the reality. But often mental health has really had tunnel vision towards the idea of privileging therapy all the time in all cases. Yeah. And that's just, you know, not necessarily the reality, I say, as a therapist myself. <laughs> well, and I am a big advocate of therapy. I'm in therapy, <laughs> but that works for me. It doesn't work for everybody. Absolutely. Yep, exactly. So one of the things that I want to ask you about is you know, this idea of grieving a parasocial relationship. Mm -hmm. So as, as we said, um, Garrison Brown, you know, died by suicide earlier this month. Mm -hmm. Many of us watched sister wives. I did since the beginning. Yeah. I jumped into a podcast talking about him. We feel like we knew the family. We saw these kids grow up, Absolutely. you know, and, and so there's also, but kind of juxtapose that with this idea of, I remember the next, I think I had therapy two days after it happened. And I went in and I immediately started with, I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but this person died and I, you know, I'm really devastated by it. And yeah. so, so what do you say to people who feel like this might be feel weird or they shouldn't have a right to grieve this relationship? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I, I think the f the first thing that we tell everyone <laughs> after a death of a, whether it's a celebrity or kind of a parasocial relationship is that it is so normal and natural to be having grief responses and grief experiences that it's something that most people at some point in their life will have a moment where a celebrity dies, someone who they didn't know in person dies, and they have a deep emotional response to it because we build relationships with people even when there are those one-sided relationships. It represents so much about ourselves. It represents things about our emotional investment and our ability to be emotionally invested in other people even when we don't know them in real life. And grief is just our normal and natural response to loss. And when we lose one of those people, that's a loss. It's we we feel the loss of that person in the world, yeah. but we also feel losses associated with our own sense of self and the passage of time and you know, the kind of relationship that we had with that person for for various reasons in our life. So it's such a normal and natural thing to happen. And I, I think to give ourselves permission to feel that, not judge ourselves for it, and um, understand that not everybody might understand it right now in this moment, but there is a good chance that at some point in their lives, everyone will experience this feeling of loss yeah. and grief for someone who they didn't know. I remember when Anthony Bourdain died. Mm -hmm. I took that really hard. It felt like there was, I don't know. It's so strange because 
if you know Anthony Bourdain, like you wouldn't describe him as the voice of optimism, right? <laughs> but it just felt like there was a light that went out in the world. It was really strange to lose that voice. I think for me as a writer, like he was just such a inspiration and mentor to me that it just felt dim. Afterwards. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, I think Anthony Bourdain, I was hit very hard by his death as mm -hmm. well. I know for me, I can remember exactly where I was when I found out that Philip Seymour Hoffman died. Um, and that was something yeah. that was really significant and, and also points to another reason that sometimes celebrity deaths are significant to us. Sometimes it taps into something about our own history of loss, right? I, yeah. I already mentioned that addiction and overdose has been part of my family and my life for a long time. And so Philip Seymour Hoffman dying of an overdose after such a long period of sobriety and recovery yeah. was really activating of some of just my own stuff. In addition to all the things I just I thought he was such an incredible actor and had so just really felt connected to him in other ways. So I do think, I mean, these losses, they like, they really imprint on us. Yeah, they really do. And I think that's a big part of what has hit me so hard with Garrison Brown is that, you know, I'm a mom and I have two 17 year old daughters. Yeah. And even though he wasn't 17, you know, he was well into his twenties. It was still you, you, I'm so hurt for his mother, mother's. Absolutely. And, and I I imagine that part of that, when we think of that connection and how we build relationships with people, even when we don't know them, when you watch a child grow up on television, when you watch mm -hmm. their parents parenting them, we tap into the ways that's correlating to our own experience and our own family life. And we, you know, build those connections yeah. there. And so it would be, I think, unreasonable to think that that wouldn't come up after a death like this, because of course, you're you're thinking about your own kids, you're thinking about your own parenting, you're you know all of that is, I imagine, coming up and and even just imagining the un, what can feel like the unmanageable, which is the idea of losing a child, and so I think it, that wow. brings up so much for any parent. I want to talk a little bit about blame. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, we do we do tend as a culture to take out the torches, right? When someone sure. has done something. And sometimes that's warranted. But I, I feel like this is happening a lot in the Sister Wives universe right now. And I don't know how familiar you are with the show. But season... I, yeah. You, you've ahead. seen it? I've seen the show, though I am not like a, fa a fan ongoing right. Right. <laughs> watcher of the show. <laughs> so Cody, his his father, has mm -hmm. they had a, a public feud that played out, you know, on season 18. And there were actual episodes where, you know, Gabriel, Garrison's younger brother, was crying on camera and saying, you know, my dad forgot my birthday. And they aired this out very publicly. And while there's an element of you know, authenticity and thank you for sharing that. It's also put Cody really in the crosshairs here of, yeah. you know, is this your fault? So can, can you talk a little bit about like why people might have that instinct, especially when someone dies so suddenly to jump to blaming somebody? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think in the world of grief, blame lives so presently. Blame towards other people, self-blame. It can be especially... Uh, heightened when there are unexpected traumatic deaths, things like this, because oftentimes we want to be able to find one single cause to this yeah. that would allow us to believe, oh, if this one thing had been different, everything would have been okay. Or in my life, I can protect myself from something devastating like this happening because I don't have a Cody in my life. And so mm -hmm. therefore, my my kids are safe or I can attribute it to just one single thing because that feels easy to understand or easier to comprehend than the reality around something like suicide, which is that it is deeply connected with mental health. It is deeply connected with 
so many factors in one's life and support system and access to care and you know, so many yeah. different things. There is never, ever, ever one single cause for someone's death by suicide. But we often want there to be. Like we want to be able to yeah. blame someone or something because it gives us a more coherent story, one that feels more comfortable than being able to say, sometimes the world is a chaotic place. Sometimes mental health is deeply overwhelming and distressing. And even with the right care and support, it doesn't always mean that someone is able to find a long-term sustained um, mental health recovery. Mm -hmm. And so the rules aren't as clear as we want them to be. And, yeah. and blame allows us to maybe believe that they're clearer than they are. Yeah. And I just feel like, you know, because again, I'm a parent. I mean, we just make so many mistakes. We just really do. And I, I'm not saying that Cody is innocent here. I'm not saying, you know, but what I'm saying is I'm sure there were other exasperating factors. There were are other contributing factors to this. Yeah. And so I know like a lot of podcasters, myself included, we've stopped covering it for now. Like we've just put a pause on it. Because when we podcast, like I tend to comfort Cody pretty hard. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm giving him a reprieve. You know, we sure. all kind of are. But I wanted to maybe speak about that. Like different people in the family have come out and mm -hmm. some have put out videos. And so, you know, some are kind of going back to normal, quote unquote. Yeah. Right. And they're mm -hmm. they're they've they've gotten some criticism for that. And I wanted to kind of mm. talk to you about like, is that a thing? Like sometimes when people are so deep in grief, does it make them feel better in some way to just get back to a normal routine? I, I Well, I think the short answer is yes. I mean, absolutely. I, I, I think the longer answer is uh, of course, because the idea that that wouldn't be true suggests that somehow like we – are thrown into deep grief and then we get to the other side of it and then we go back to normal life. Right. And that's just not the reality. I mean, when no matter how devastating a loss, you still have to figure out how to feed your kids and get them off to school and get to work or figure out how you're going to take care of your house or, you know, you have to do the stuff of normal living. And what grief is, is this ongoing oscillation that is always happening between the work of grieving and the emotions and the thoughts and everything that comes with grief alongside of all of just the work of living, like the day-to-day -day of normal life. And so mm -hmm. there's a, a grief theory called the dual process model of grief, which I love, which is really about how what we need to adjust to is understanding that there's not five stages. You don't get to acceptance and then get back mm -hmm. to normal life. Like that's, we, we know that's not true. There is this ongoing oscillation that we're always doing. And from the very beginning, oftentimes we're tapping into normal life because mm -hmm. we have to and because it can be comforting, like routine when it feels like we're completely unmoored, when we've lost someone and it feels like our world has shattered, being able to hold on to a little sense of normalcy and just yeah. like go to Target and, you know, have a cup of coffee, like that can be the little stuff that allows you to feel like you're getting through the day. So I think it's important incredibly important to understand that that is that's just what we'd expect to see for most people is that there's some normalcy and some deep grief and always oscillating between those things so because you specialize in sudden grief or sudden mm -hmm. death and sudden yeah. loss what are some challenges and difficulties around that specifically that this family might be facing rather than, you know, anticipatory grief or uh, the death of someone who's been sick a long time or an older person? Like, what are some of the unique challenges around that? Sure. Uh, I think that it's always it, it's always hard to know because si every situation is sure. a little bit different. Um, but certainly, I think some of the things that we know for many people can be more intense with this are just 
their own feelings of guilt and regret and like coulda, woulda, shoulda with mm -hmm. anticipated losses when somebody has been sick, when somebody is older, there's often not that same sense that the death was preventable. But when we see unexpected losses, losses, things like suicides, overdoses, even accidents, you know, there is a lot more of those feelings of if I had just answered the phone when he called, if I had yeah. just if gone over to his house a few minutes earlier, if this had happened, if this, you know, that there's a lot more of that replaying and that, um, you know, that kind of, again, wanting to find a cause Sometimes we're more comfortable blaming ourselves than saying there's nothing that could have been done or this was completely, um, you know, it, unable to be predicted. So I think that's one thing we definitely see. Also, not unsurprisingly, there's just a period of numbness and shock that can be more present for people where it just feels more surreal. Anticipatory mm. grief when we know someone is going to die, our brain sort of starts to practice imagining the world a little bit after the loss. And that's totally yeah. normal and natural. We start to think about what's it going to be like when they're not here anymore? How am I going to cope? What's it going to feel like? And even though when the loss comes, it might be completely different than we expected, we've still done some of that rehearsing with unexpected deaths, we haven't had the chance for our brain to do any of that imagining, any of that rehearsing. And so we're completely caught off guard. There can be a, a much greater feeling of maybe feeling dissociated or detached, like you're in a dream, like you're feeling mm -hmm. like you're watching yourself from outside of yourself um, that happens after losses like this. So it just takes a little bit longer for people to go through mm -hmm. that um, process of really understanding the reality of the death and starting to kind of remap the world as a place where that that person is no longer here. Um, so that's another one. And and actually blame between posts when folks when there are deaths like this that are stigmatized. We often mm. see that within families, within friend groups, people blame each other more that there is sometimes less of a feeling of being able to access external support um, because mm. of worries about judgment, um, worries about what other people are going to think. You know, that might not necessarily be true in something unexpected like a car accident or a stroke, but in something like this where there are those worries about blame and stigma, people are more likely not to want to access support groups, not to want to talk to other people about the loss, sometimes not being open about the cause of death because of those fears that layer on top of it about social judgment that is going to be part of their grief. That's a really good point. Like I could see a world in which Cody and Janelle don't seek out therapy. Yeah. And I hope that's not the case. You know, I hope they are both able to whatever resources that whatever way that looks for them. I hope that Absolutely. they are able to do it. Well, and sometimes that when there's self-blame, sometimes not seeking support is almost a form of self-punishment. It's feeling yeah. like I don't deserve to feel better. I don't deserve to learn how to manage the emotions of this loss and move forward. Because if I believe in some way that it was my fault, um, which I'm not speaking of this situation specifically, but just of almost any parent mm -hmm. in a circumstance where their child has died, even anticipated losses, parents mm -hmm. will find ways to blame themselves, right? As a parent, you of feel course. like your one job is to, to keep your kids alive. And if that has, has failed, then we feel like I have failed. So why would I deserve to get support? So sometimes when people don't, it's because of their fear of stigma and judgment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's also because they don't think they're deserving. And, it, you know, if there's one thing I could say to, to everybody, it's that everyone is deserving of yeah. support. Everyone is deserving of being able to figure out how to manage the emotions that come with loss. Um, but we don't always feel that way in the depths of grief. Hey, everyone. Stay tuned. Little Miss Recap will be right back after these words. 
I, I just can't help but, you know, just ache for them both. I mean, I really do hope that they are being supported in the way that they need to be and that they can find their way through it. Um, my next question is, what are some thoughts that you might have around people who are wondering or maybe conflicted about, like, should I be watching the show? Should I not? Does it feel icky? Is that a personal decision everybody has to make? Are those normal feelings that people are, are kind of struggling with that? Yeah, I mean, I think they're completely normal feelings to be struggling with it. And we see this in so many ways. It's so interesting when grief is put out there, whether it is on reality television or on social media, there is often uh, so many so much commentary and there are often so many mixed feelings about should I be watching this or not? Is this capitalizing off of someone's death or is it wrong or voyeuristic to watch someone's grief? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is, it's really a personal decision. I think one thing that's really hard for us to come to terms with when we look at reality shows, especially long running reality shows, is this is often connected to somebody's financial well-being, whether right. a show continues, how they do this, you know, asking someone on top of their own grief to, to cease their income <laughs> is something that is kind of unreasonable to do. And yet at the same time, we might feel conflicted about whether we want to watch it anymore or whether it, it should be there. I think it really is a personal decision. One thing I would say is it's worth investigating what it's bringing up for you. Um, hmm. Is it that you're just not comfortable watching grief because we've done such a good job of containing grief and not showing it? And so therefore, we feel like somehow it's wrong to look at it, like it's okay for us to look at all these other complex things that happen in people's lives, but it's not okay to look at this in some ways, I think that continues to reinforce a culture where grief stays in the shadows, where we don't have good yeah. open dialogue about it, where, where we shy away from conversations. So I think, you know, thinking about that and at the same time, if there are things about it that, it, that you feel icky about, like oh, there's also no reason to – put your time and your energy into a place that you feel like is draining you in some way or that you feel like you you don't support. I mean, I think the way that we give things our energy, whether that's our time, our emotions, our money, whatever it is, it's sort of that's what we're endorsing in the world. And if you really right. interrogate what it's bringing up for you and you think like, I don't feel good about this or watching it is not good for my well-being, then I think it's important to say this is something that I'm going to step away from. But to try to maybe reserve a little bit of the judgment that might come towards the people themselves who are living it because there is so much that they're going through. There are financial implications and mm -hmm. um, we can never really imagine what we would do in another situation. So I think it's easy to say, you know, to judge and to say, oh, they shouldn't be putting this on TV or I'm going to yeah. not watch out of protest, <laughs> but to appreciate the layers of complexity that are there. It's interesting because I'm often fascinated with this idea. And I think you're, you touched on this, that socially we tend to put grief in silos and it's really interesting. I saw a lot of this with the, the gun violence work that I've done in the school shootings mm -hmm. is this idea, I remember speaking with a mother from Sandy Hook whose daughter had survived the shooting in that classroom, and she felt like she couldn't go anywhere in public with her daughter, and she felt like she couldn't say anything because my daughter lived, right, because I have my daughter. And I, I remember thinking at the time, that's so complicated because that's your fellow like human. And I, I would think it would be comforting for that human to get all of the humanity that they can have. But I also understood the complexity of some kind of survivor's guilt. And yes. it was really, it was really just this fascinating dynamic. And I, I don't know yeah. if that's a new cultural shift or if that's something that's always happened. Do you notice that in your work as well? 
I think that that definitely happens. And I don't, I think it maybe happens in different ways now, but I mm -hmm. think it is something that, uh, that deep survivor's guilt, I think is something that has been there long before, you know, social media or some of the other factors that might amp amplify or intensify it. Um, I think even around thinking back to 9-11, that there mm. were survivors who I think felt deep and complicated feelings about being survivors and um, what that means. So I think there's so many layers and how people also feel a little bit of a, a social press pressure that they are, if they're in the public eye in some way, whether it's because of the school shooting or a celebrity situation, that there's what it's bringing up for them, what it's bringing up for their children, but then sure. also a feeling of, do I have some sort of social responsibility um, in how I am coming forward and how I'm talking about it or in how I'm not talking about it or being less visible? Is that the right thing to do? Right. And there's a lot of layers to that, you know, but we do know that sometimes people will feel a pressure in their grief of saying, I felt like I had to say something or I, I should do this because maybe it would help someone else. Um, so sometimes it's on the other side. It's feeling like my I feel an obligation to be mm. open because if I'm in the social space already, I kind of owe it to other people to be forthcoming about mm. what I'm going through and my loss yeah. in an effort to help other people who are in the same place. And that's complicated too. Um, yeah. You know, there's just a lot, a lot of layers. It is because I know with the Sandy Hook families, like they, some of them felt like we need to share our story and talk about it. And look what happened. You know, Alex Jones and the, Absolutely. Uh, the media machine. And yep. Ugh. Yeah. Um, so I guess what, what I wanted to ask next is how can people from afar, if this is a parasocial mm -hmm. relationship, how can they support this family? How can they, you know, should they be engaging? I, I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer to this, right? But a lot of us feel helpless. Like, how can we help in this situation? So are there ways that we can do that maybe by donating or something? I'm not really sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's there's two levels, right? There's when we feel helpless, there's thinking about what in this moment would help me. And that can sound a little selfish. Like, wait a mm -hmm. minute, if I'm grieving yeah. from afar, um, do I really need to be helping myself? But it, it is useful, right? And so if you feel helpless, if you're feeling heartbroken by this situation, under, understandably, thinking about would doing something that supports uh, suicide prevention organizations or things that could help support mental health resources, mental health for men, which is a really a difficult area. Yeah. Would that make me feel like I've done something kind of in his memory and in his honor and to, to honor the fact that he was a person who I didn't know in real life? but mm -hmm. who did have an impact on me. And so I do want to put something out into the world. Maybe it's not related to the way that he died. Maybe it's related to the way that you connected with something about him on screen in the way that he lived. Mm -hmm. And you decide that that's something that you want to, want to do or make a donation or even just something like making your own post on social that's not about – your judgments about the family or your right. feelings about the situation or what, but like something about the way that this is a person in the world who left an impression on you. And that that is something that is worth creating a space for aside mm -hmm. from all of this other, uh, maybe, you know, drama that surrounds it or all this conversation that's happening yeah. around it to carve out something that is just about his humanity and, and your humanity. Um, apart from all of those things. So I think that that's one piece. And in terms of the the family and you know what could be helpful, that I think becomes a lot more complicated because yeah. one it's probably different for every member of that family mm -hmm. in different ways, right? What we need in grief is almost always different from person to person. Yeah. And so that's something I think just to be aware of. There's no one right answer. So the other piece that I would just say is just to listen to what you are hearing 
from family members if they are posting and try to respect what is coming from them and understand that though you have a certain idea about what grief is supposed to look like and how people should grieve, that it really does come in all different shapes and sizes. And often the way that we can be the most supportive is by coming from a place of curiosity and Mm non-judgment and being able to contain our own commentary and instead just understand that what we can do is be open to people and support their grief in the way that they're asking for it to be supported. Um, and that can be can be tricky when it's someone who we don't know or when we're getting different messages from different family members. Right. But I think just being open to that is what's most important. One of the criticisms I saw was Mary, Cody's first wife, she had she has this thing she does Fridays with friends and it's a big social event on Instagram and she she did it I think last week for the first time and people were like, Oh, da, 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 that's too soon. But my thing has always been, you don't know what support somebody has at home. Like I might go dark on social media because I have a large support network at home. Yeah. She might not. And that connection with people who she knows loves, love her. And will, you know, she might need that. Like she might Absolutely. need that in that moment. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that's so important to remember is that, Social connection, whether it is with our very close friends and family or whether it is with people via social media and communities of fan support, when we feel alone, isolated, heartbroken, Mm -hmm. oftentimes remembering that that support is out there, that there are people is so important. And it doesn't have to take the shape of traditional relationships that we imagine. Sometimes it's tapping in. Again, in a celebrity case, it may be with fans, it Mm -hmm. may be with people who you game with, it may be through other social media connections with people you've never even met in real life before because of other communities. There isn't a hierarchy of when and how we should be thinking about reaching out for support. The important thing is that people are reaching out for support. And again, I think creating a space where other people who may be hurting can come is is a valuable thing if that's a possibility. Yeah. What are some, I want to end with, what are some ways people can take just a little better care of themselves? Nurture their mental health a little bit, just, you know, kind of put up some protective factors to get through this. Yeah, I think that it's a great question. I think one of the things that's so important to ask yourself is what has helped you in other hard times, especially if maybe you have not been giving this as much space, not thinking of it as as valid or worthy of grief and the emotions that you're feeling because it is someone who you didn't know in real life. Try to set that aside. Show yourself really that care and and compassion for what you're feeling. And then say, what has helped me through other hard moments, whether it is, you know, other other deaths of people who you know, whether it's been breakups or job losses or anything else, Mm -hmm. really just tapping into those moments in the past and thinking about who have the people been um, who have been there for me? And is that somebody who I could just open up to and let them know that I'm feeling this? If you've been feeling a little self-judgment about having so much grief about the situation, you may have kept quiet about it. But it can be really useful to talk to people in your real life. Taking a break from some of the social media, if you feel like being tapped into all of this commentary from different people and different judgments and looking at what's going on, if you feel yourself having judgment that you don't feel like you can set aside about how the other family members are presenting on social media or what they're doing, maybe you mute for a little while. Maybe you just say, I need to get some space from this because it is bringing up some of my own stuff. And I want to be able to just tend to that with some distance from all the things that are happening on social media. Um, I think the other piece that I would say is looking for that kind of active piece of what we can do. Often situations Mm -hmm. like this, do really bring out our sense of feeling helpless. And if you are feeling helpless, just think about something that you can do in the world that feels like it's it's 
active and putting good into the world. I think a lot yeah. of times that we underestimate um, that helping another person, reaching out and doing something that feels um, helpful, volunteering our time, just like mm -hmm. leaving a really generous tip when you go to the coffee shop, like those little things help us to remember that even when there are, are terrible things happening in the world, when so much feels outside of our control, that there are little things that we can do every day that put some good into the world and that oftentimes help to kind of boost us up even as we're helping other people. So those would be I, I off the that. top of my head, <laughs> the big ones. I love that. And and the reason why I think this is resonating with so many people as well is because like for me personally, reality TV was my escape. That yes. was my place to get away from, you know, the ongoing dumpster fire that tends to be our news and everything like that. So yeah. like to have this tragedy happen in my escape pod, if you will, was really, it, it was tough. So there is some comfort though, that I do find. And I think going back and watching older episodes and, you know, just kind of, I'm starting to, to reintroduce the material back and it, it's mm -hmm. feeling okay. So, yeah, I, I love that. I think that, you know, one of the things that in grief that we talk about is this idea of continued bonds or continued connections. You know, we keep those continued bonds and connections. And sometimes right after a death, we feel like when we think of that person or the, those associations, it's so activating, it's so emotional, it's so overwhelming that we feel like, Oh, I'm never going to be able to find comfort in this again. Yeah. I'm never going to be able to remember the good memories because it's just going to make me think of my grief and the devastation. And often what happens is that starts to evolve with time. And we come to a place where we can hold both things at the same time and say, yes, this this does always carry with it now something that will be heartbreaking and also, I am still able to access and tap back in to what made it so meaningful to me that it actually was worthy of this grief that I feel, which is that it was something that really was comforting and it, that helped me escape and that I really did connect with. And so I can kind of tap back into that and, and hold it all at the same time. So I love that for you, that it's starting to come back in that way. Yeah, I don't know because I, I can be quite ruthless when I'm making fun of Cody especially. So I don't know if I'll ever get to that point. Do you know what sure. I mean? But yeah. I'm really interested to see season 19 because I'm they're filming it now. And I'm really interested to see, it's my hope because I'm Pollyannish about this stuff, that this brings the family together and that yeah. we see like a, a nice healing journey over the wounds that have been inflicted for years, not just around this. Right. And so that's what I'm hoping. But yeah. we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, know I've, I've said many times grief often brings out either the best or the worst in families, unfortunately. And so it's it's so hard to know. But I think sometimes being open to just seeing what healing looks like for a family and knowing that sometimes it's messy, sometimes yeah. it, it is that thing of, of bringing people together, but that either way – Again, it's bringing grief into the spotlight in a way that for me, it feels like it can be helpful for us to just see the ways that people grieve. And um, hopefully it is a journey that brings them all together. Absolutely. I hope so. Can you tell everyone, is your podcast called What's Your Grief? It is. It's called What's Your Grief? And what, um, do, you, what do you talk about on the podcast? Because I have a lot of podcast listeners who are always looking for other good stuff. So, Oh, we just chat about grief all day, all day, every day, all grief okay. all the time. Um, we are both mental health professionals. We don't have a guest format. We okay. just talk about topics people ask us to talk about. And we really do a lot of kind of deep dives into the really nuanced areas of grief. One of the things that we felt so frustrated about um, when we founded What's Your Grief and when we started the podcast is that a lot of stuff about grief was like really broad, really general, mm -hmm. vague, not very specific. And we've always taken the approach of really wanting to deep dive into so many of the complicated, nuanced aspects of grief, both in the immediate days after a loss, but really 
across a lifetime. Like grief stays with us in some way forever. Yeah. And and that's okay. Like that's uh, that is something that we learn how to live with. But oftentimes the conversation about grief stops at like the end of the first year. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how grief continues to be part of our lives. We talk about when we see it out in the media and in yeah. books and movies. And yeah, we just, we chat about grief. <laughs> well, I'll be listening because I love this conversation. I love the work that you do. And I, I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me for sharing your expertise with my audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yo, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for, for leaning into talking about this. Like I think yeah. so often it is easier to just say, this is messy, this is complicated. Grief is, you know, not something people want to talk about and, and shy away from it. So I really appreciate you creating a space for it. Um, it's amazing. Thanks. I appreciate that. All right, guys, you know where to find Lita. She's at whatsyourgrief.com. You could look for the podcast. I'm assuming it's on Apple, Spotify, yeah, everywhere you get all your the, podcasts. All yep. the places. And we're on social media everywhere at What's Your Grief. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.